So the only reason we ever want a biosimilar is economic. So the agenda for biosimilars is really set by economists. Here are my disclosures. So I'm going to just cover five topics here to help bring us through. So the first is something called more health for the money, which of course will make anyone from the WHO listen hard. Because there are drugs that we really want, because the world of medicine is changing. My great-grandfather was a doctor, rode on his horse to see patients, and the illnesses he treated then were accidents, problems of childbirth, infections, and nutritional troubles. But the world is changing because we're seeing a huge rise in what we call non-communicable diseases. And this is a heat map. The darker the color, the more of it there is. And how we tackle this? Well, we'll prevent NCDs by lifestyle changes and by preventative medicines, and we'll want to treat them better. So what I can tell you is that there is a huge unmet need for more medicines, for more indications, for more patients, and that will not go away. The most important globally is cancer, just because it happens to have the greatest impact on lost life when you should be looking after your family, the greatest economic impact. And why is it important? Well, think about the diseases that we might consider. Malaria, TB, HIV, these are very important killers for the world. But cancer has a bigger impact than malaria, TB and HIV altogether three times over. And I've chosen those examples very carefully because we have a world program to deliver affordable medicines for malaria, TB and HIV, but not yet for cancer. And yet it's more important than all of them together three times over. And it's very important here. Middle East North Africa is the hotspot for cancer. It's the fastest rising area for cancer incidents in the world. And therefore, planning an affordable cancer strategy for Egypt is going to be crucial to its sustainability. And what drives the anxieties of my colleagues in the purchasing and pricing department is this. Innovation in cancer medicine has been very expensive. Of the 12 new drugs approved in 2012, 11 cost more than $100,000 a year. Even the richest countries in the world are in despair. And it's driven by innovation. Cancer is a big user of biologic targeted therapy, and the costs of those cause our cancer budget to rise five times faster than other budgets. We have a problem. Just as these drugs could transform cancer, we can't afford to see the program through. Because rationing always occurs. It's either by your personal ability to pay, how rich you are, or by society's willingness to pay. So in America, for example, the diagnosis of cancer will destroy the life savings of the family. In one in five cases, that's the money put aside for children's universities and for retirement. So fear of cancer is enormous. And the fear isn't just the suffering and the shortened life, it's the cost to the family. Now, our health systems, even in rich Europe, are under stress. If you take a basic access to health care as being that when you're ill, you can get a prescription and fill it and see the doctor and get recommended care, then you may be surprised to see in Europe and the world how many countries fail that for at least half their population. Now, you're not surprised to see America in trouble, because in America, medicine is a profit-making business. But are you surprised to see France, Germany, Holland, Norway, Sweden, and Switzerland? We are all under pressure. And pharma companies know this. Regulating the drug isn't enough. You need to have the drug in your pharmacy. So let's just look at the 49 recent innovative oncology drugs launched, and look at the countries that launched at least half of those drugs. Now, there are 200 countries in the world. Half or more were launched in only six. Those other countries had no access to the drug. They weren't launched. And having it in the pharmacy is no good if you can't afford to buy it. So out of 200 countries in the world, how many could afford to reimburse from general health service funds at least half the drugs? And the answer is two countries in the world. 
The reality of cancer care now is very serious. The WISH report told us it's not affordable for most patients, many payers, nearly all governments, and it's a global issue. We all share an interest in putting this right. So in rich countries like America, Britain, and Australia, the Anglosphere, we're expecting our budgets to be rising at between 35 and 5% every year just to stand still. And these drugs do more than just transform cancer. You just look at monoclonal antibodies and see how many diseases now have been transformed by these drugs. You realize that the issue of sourcing these drugs at cheaper rates isn't just a cancer medicines problem. But if we narrow our debate to cancer drugs, if we can find a way of making cancer medicine affordable, we have a model to use for all the other important diseases that we must treat. Because it's true, access to innovation has one key rule. The only drug that works is one that we can afford to give. And on our current pathway, cancer medicine is increasingly unaffordable as a component of healthcare. These drugs are for the very richest in society. Out of 200 countries in the world, 75% of all the world's precision targeted therapy is used in just seven countries, leaving 25% for the other 193, and that's not fair. Which is why the WHO report came out called More Health for the Money. It said every country can do something to improve the efficiency, the cost effectiveness of their health systems, to release money to treat more people with better treatments. And of the 10 leading things you should attack to make your health system go better, number one, underusing patent expired copy drugs and paying more than you need for medicines. Why? We write many more prescriptions in a day than we'll do radiotherapy or surgery. And the impact of the drug budget is seen in one year. Better treatment for cancer is measured in five year survival differences. So in Britain, we worried, could we afford this advance in therapy? And it's always in the small print in the British Medical Journal. There it is. They said, well, the way to make it affordable is for cheaper generic or more accurately biosimilar versions of biologic drugs which fits with the Lancet Commission view of affordable cancer care. There are six categories you should go for, and the most important one in this context is to find an equally effective treatment at lower cost. Now, if biosimilars are all about economics, I have to teach you to become an economist in just a few minutes, and you're clever people, so I promise you we can do it. Because by definition, Biosimilars have no clinically meaningful differences. The only reason to use them is because you understand economics. You've got to understand, to be able to read the reports to make the right decision. So here we go, economics for the uninitiated. Economics is not primarily about saving money. It's about using scarce resources as efficiently as possible. Economists never say cheap or expensive. They say cost effective or not cost effective. We will spend a lot of money on an intervention if it has a fabulous outcome. You know more economics than you think, I promise you. Because economics is scary only because of the language. Economics is Greek. It's a Greek word. In fact, it's two Greek words, oikos and nomos. Wise rules for the household. Wise rules for running a household. If you spend a lot of money at the start of the year on a new car, there is no summer holiday down by the Red Sea. It's very simple. Health economics, therefore, are wise rules for managing clinics, hospitals, health systems, the jobs that we do all the time, day in and day out. So for drug purchasing, remember when we taught you pharmacology, we taught you the two E's of pharmacology. Can it work? Efficacy. Does it work in reality? That's effectiveness. And I just want you to add a third E to your decisions which economists call efficiency or cost-effectiveness. And let's translate it simply. Is this worth doing compared with other things we could do with the same money? And that decision isn't just for people who set prices, for physicians, for pharmacists, it's for pharma companies. Is developing biosimilars worth doing compared with other things they could do with the same money? Because spending money 
has an opportunity cost, as we call it. Each pound, dollar, euro can only be spent once. Once you've spent the money, you've lost the opportunity to spend it on something else. And that's what we call the economy, the opportunity cost of spending. Which explains why medical decision making is evolving fast. When I began medicine, we made decisions based about mechanism of action. Breast cancers expressed hormone receptors. Taking the hormones away should make breast cancer resolve. But I'm an editor of a Cochrane facility. So we know that it's about randomized trials for evidence-based medicine. And the question we ask is, does this intervention make you live significantly longer or live better than the one before? So for trastuzumab for breast cancer, the answer is yes and yes. But we're now moving to a new medical decision-making model, which we call VBM, value-based medicine. And this looks at value to everyone. And the question is, is this worth doing compared with other things we could do with the same resource? So for an insurance company, that would be money. For a hospital director, it could be the number of doctors and pharmacists they have, scanner time. For a patient, it could be time in hospital. Would you have a slightly less effective drug for outpatient treatment? What have we learned from generics? What do we know about the economics of generics? Because we've had bioequivalent generics for 30 years. Well, the first thing is that they're cost effective. So they enable us to give more treatment for more patients without breaking the budget. We know that that impacts on the financial toxicity for patients because if we prescribe a generic, less patients abandon their treatments. What they do next depends on your country. If you're in a region with very good access to the drug, all that you can do is save money to spend in other ways, and that's a very valuable thing. But for a country with low access to a drug, cheaper versions enable us to give it to more people for more indications. And so, for countries like Britain and America, the impact is enormous. So in America, for California, look, they saved 21.7 billion last year. Similar for Texas. So this explains why Britain and America, being very focused on value, around 85% of our prescriptions are made over to generic medicines or biosimilars. And this, of course, creates trouble, because to make this work, you have competition between different manufacturers. And in the light of concerns about rising drug prices, it's very important that we create a market for these drugs that drives competition to make lower prices. The only reason to use these drugs is because they cost less. So given the importance of this, has there been a systematic survey of barriers to follow-on medicines in Egypt? And I can tell you already, I know one, the done meta-analysis of the public's understanding of generics tells us that most of the public believe that cheaper drugs can never be as good as more expensive drugs. So to counter that, I have been on national public radio in Malaysia to explain to the public why cheaper drugs, when you have good regulators, can be good. Who else has been out to talk to the media? Television, radio, newspapers, is it just me? It's a very important role that we must take on public understanding of this issue. Now, we want multiple companies to compete because the more competition you get, the better the price. This looks at the erosion of prices, whether you have one generic, two, three, four, or five. <coughs> and the take home message from this is that you want to encourage multiple manufacturers to compete for tenders, which is why America is looking at incentives. When a drug's important, you want to encourage at least three manufacturers to launch. So in Malaysia, we've had a big meeting about speeding up the launch of these drugs in Malaysia. Why should they go to a country that's 80th out of 200 in the world for wealth? Because we make it attractive to them. So the first three are offered a fast track through. And I'm sure we'll discuss later the idea from the WHO about pre-qualification. It's a big program run out of London for generics, where if London approves a generic, 14 other countries will also approve it based on some limited extra questions, which speeds up access. Remember, if it's not launched in your country, you can't even buy it. Now, 
we typically worry about prices. But if we drive the price down with anti-competitive measures of some sort, then we have difficulties. Because if it gets too cheap, manufacturers pull out, leading to drug shortages when the profits fall, which creates a new monopoly over again, which is the opposite of what we want. Now, we know a lot about the, bio, the generic market. What about the biosimilar market? Well, we've had 12 years in Europe, so it's easy. More competition leads to more competitive prices. This shows the price erosion of infliximab, a wonder drug for arthritis. That's the drug of the original, the original price at launch. And you'll see each new version launched led to a price reduction. Now, the yellow dot is what happened with generics. So the answer is the price doesn't fall as much or as fast but the shape of the curve is the same. If we hang on long enough, we will drive the prices down. So when you look at Europe, for example, at filgrastib, white cell growth factor, a drug that stops you getting infections during chemotherapy, and all of these countries share one regulator, and the use of the drug varies between 1 and 100%, you realize that the regulator is not the most important step in this, there is something that happens after the regulator that ends up being more important. So, what's in it for the manufacturer? If you can increase patient access, you can make these drugs in more cost-effective large volume facilities, which means that the cost per gram of the drug will fall, which is why there is this very strong relationship between volume of sales and the discount. The same for buying cars. If you ring up a garage and say, I'd like to buy a car, you'll get a tiny discount. If you ring up and say, I'd like to buy 100 cars, you will get a much bigger discount. And this is the engine that drives it. Increasing volumes lead to better discounts. And if that cycle is broken, then this model does not work. Because the investment needed is very different to generics. It costs around a million to four million dollars to make a generic and it can be done in one year. But it takes around seven to eight years and somewhere between 100 and 250 million dollars to create a biosimilar. And that explains why no one country can afford to de develop biosimilars. They were always developed for world global markets because it involves hundreds of millions of dollars over years. So, when you launch these drugs, you ask three very good questions. Because we want the discount, it's an economic tool. We will get the biggest discount when that cost has been paid off. When there's a market that's free and fair for competition so that the manufacturers can cut costs and drive access to more people. And when you buy in volume for longer times. So this is the business cycle of a drug. When you start developing a drug, you're putting money into development and trials which cost you. But in time that a drug launches and you earn money, and over the lifetime a successful company will earn money back to fund the development of the next drug. This is what happens to sales. So look, when the drug is launched, there's an investment that has to be paid off, and there's a point at which anything after that is a profit, at which point the manufacturer can bring the price down. And ideally, competition erodes the price. But we reach a point where the drug is no longer cost-effective to be made and is withdrawn from the market, which has already been seen for some biosimilars. And if it withdraws down to one manufacturer, you have a monopoly all over again. Now, biosimilars are a challenge. The generic model means that you can pay off development within a few months. But for biosimilars, it is very different. It takes 10 times longer and an investment up to 250 times greater. And therefore, biosimilars offer an enormous risk to manufacturers. So if we compare the business of generics and biosimilars, we find that the probability of success for a biosimilar is not high. Many biosimilars have been abandoned in development, even after the phase three trials. The development time is very long. If you choose to develop the wrong drug, your company could have spent eight years of wasted time. The cost is high. The pricing is only going to be worthwhile if you get a reasonable return. And it costs a lot to market it because patients and physicians are scared. 
And it's not yet certain that after 12 years and 40 brands launched in Europe, that biosimilars actually are a business that will make a profit for pharma. It's very delicate. So in Europe, the experience we know comes from 700 million patient days with the biosimilars, which is a clinical success. It's an economic success in that we clearly can see they increase access to treatment as long as the European Commission finds these points working. That you create competition that drives down the price. And they've said that the difference between price and market share is very low. Price is not the driver. In some therapeutic areas, dropping the price can increase penetration. If you have a low access market, cheaper drugs mean more patients get treated, which is obviously useful in the context of middle income countries like Egypt. The first drug to launch has an advantage, so you want to encourage them to get moving. And they have a potential to improve access globally. Very good. So how do we do it in my country, in Britain, with the National Health Service? Well, because of the importance, we procure drugs through regional or central authorities. And we decide which one to use dependent on the drug. And because biosimilars offer such an enormous potential, four of our biggest budget drugs in the National Health Service, out of those, three are anti-inflammatory biologic drugs. If we could reduce the price of those drugs by half, I showed the government, we could afford for free 17,500 new nurses, and nurses save lives too. So when we have a single monopoly drug, before the biosimilars come along, we do a health technology assessment and purchase based on a battle between a monopoly buyer and a monopoly producer. But remember, generics and biosimilars are driven by competition. So what we do to create competition is we divide the NHS into three zones and we tender for each zone for a population of around 20 million people. So a company wants to launch in Britain, if they don't get the first tender bid, they can hang on for the second and the third. And this goes round with regular cycles. And our experience is that we drive the price down slowly while sustaining multiple manufacturers in our market. So the economic logic is clear. It's competition. And eventually the price will go down to the cost it takes to produce and a little bit of profit. In the end, it's the best. And therefore, it's clear you need to work out what might block that, because there are blocks at all levels. So America, we know, has been not nowhere near as successful because of legal, economic blocks, predatory pricing, deals with, with uh, hospitals to share the excess profits between the drug company and the hospital, so that the savings are not passed on to the patient. Remember, the life cycle is the key. At the point where the originator loses patent, they have paid off the investment, and it is the most profitable time for the drug. Every year they can put off competition is the biggest potential to earn for that company. But the biosimilar maker is at its most vulnerable time. It's invested $200, $250 million, and it's only beginning to have sales, which is why it's very vulnerable to anti-competitive behavior because it's such a big and a long investment. Now, why do we want biosimilars to succeed? Have you noticed every biosimilar so far has been a copy of a blockbuster drug? But 70 patents of biologics will expire in the next 10 years of drugs that are very costly for our citizens, that are not blockbusters, and we want copies of those as well. We have a shared interest between health service payers and pharma companies in making this a success, so that we have cheaper versions, for example, of myozyme in the future. These are drugs that cost currently $250,000 a year for a child. There's a concern, therefore, that this is not a profitable industry, and the world leader, the manufacturer that introduced biosimilars to Europe and America, and its most recent shareholder review, has not made a profit. This is a very risky business. Which is why the launch sequence is key. You launch in countries that will give you returns to pay off that risky investment. Which is why a country like Malaysia is bending over backwards to encourage 
early launches there and why there's a WHO program that I'm sure we'll discuss. Because the drug purchasing authority wants value, the drug maker wants value from biosimilars, and we have to understand what drives that balance. And because this is so crucial, there's a lot of strategic research being done. Which country should you launch? In which markets? And who are you addressing? Who are you selling to? And if either of these groups don't get value, they will walk away. And emerging markets are the most vulnerable. Now, the ones that are mapped out that we understand are obviously the developed world. I've given you data already from that. Egypt, despite it having the largest population in the Middle East, North Africa region, the biggest growth area in the world for cancer in the next 20 years. Partly because you already understand, for example, in comparison with equivalent wealth countries like Lebanon or Iraq, you spend two to three times as much. So this is an area that is fraught with caution for everyone. And getting it right will be a, a key to make these a success or a failure. So, health service pairs understand the value, but there is no uniformity of approach in Europe. What I can tell you is, this is the most recent review. And four countries stand out, because many countries are demanding a reference price. Cuts of between 7.5 and 42%. But the most successful four countries, Denmark, Germany, Sweden, and the United Kingdom, set no price. They leave the market to drive the price down between the companies. So, for example, the 42% demanded in Ireland should make it a huge success. But you know, that is the second worst country in Europe for using biosimilars. The launch of Etanacept biosimilars should have led to a 42% price reduction in one year that country used three doses of biosimilar. Three doses in the entire country. Why would you launch a drug in Ireland? So my summary. How do we judge the success of these medicines? Well, obviously, clinically on one hand, are they as safe and as effective as the ones that came before? But ultimately, the success of these drugs will only be economic. They're designed to be similar in everything except we want them to be dissimilar in price. So, clinically, these are safe drugs. You can extrapolate them, you can switch them as part of tender. But economically, their use is unpredictable and is not related to pricing. It's not obviously a profitable market. And to date, anyone who's made a copy has made it for a blockbuster drug. We need to stay steady and think, where do we want to be 10 years' time with this innovation in value of pharmaceuticals. Biosimilars are innovation as much as originator drugs. So, just a quick summary then. Getting the drugs launched in your country is the first key to using them. Competition erodes value. Generics and biosimilars share the same response to innovation but the magnitude and timing is different because the investment is so much longer and so much bigger. And understanding that should enable you to grow a successful biosimilars market because the regulators can only do one small part. Thank you so much.